All right, good morning, everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Just a reminder to everyone here in the crowd to put your cell phone pagers on silent or mute, and those at our remote sites to also put your computer microphones on silent as well. We have two speakers today, which Dr. Stevenson's gonna introduce our speakers today. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today on behalf of the Division of Emergency Medicine. Dr. Megan Lanowitz comes to us from an adult emergency medicine residency at the University of Michigan, followed by a fellowship in pediatric emergency medicine at the University of Arkansas at Arkansas Children's Hospital. She joined us in 2011 and as of July 1st will be an associate professor in pediatrics with us. And Megan has been instrumental in changing the way that we provide care to traumatically injured children in our emergency department through her leadership of our trauma choreography program. Dr. Amy Hansen is presenting with her today, and she is an assistant professor of pediatrics, having joined us after completing a residency at Loyola and a fellowship in pediatric emergency medicine at the University of Utah. And Amy leads crisis resource management training for us in an interdisciplinary way in the emergency department and also helps our fellows and faculty with critical procedure training and skill maintenance. And when you don't find one of these two physicians in the emergency department providing excellent care at the bedside, you'll find them leading a sim, teaching a sim, you'll find them planning for a sim, or helping someone else do a sim. <laughs> Um, they also have leadership roles um, in our SPARC program, and it is a great pleasure to introduce what they're going to share with us today because they are making a difference in how we care for acutely injured and ill children in our emergency department by team preparation and training. So, Dr. Lanowitz and Dr. Hansen. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Today's discussion is going to center around how we can provide effective teamwork that improves the care we provide in a medical crisis. We chose this topic um, because we all work in medicine and so emergency conditions can and will occur to all of us at some point. They may occur in different settings. You may be experiencing a child who's having a seizure in your clinic or um, a patient who has worsening clinical status on the floor, in the ICU, or potentially the operating room. If you've ever cared for a patient experiencing a medical emergency, you can appreciate that even the best laid plans can fall apart in those conditions. So here we're presenting a method of bringing order to that potential chaos of medical crisis. We have no disclosures to make. Our objectives today are to understand what the principles are of effective teamwork in a medical crisis, specifically the team dynamics that come into play in those situations. We'd also like to recognize and avoid the common human errors that occur when working in teams. Then we'll apply the principles of effective teamwork to a clinical setting with the goal of continuing to incorporate these principles into our practice so we can improve the delivery of care we provide to our patients. We feel it is important to have effective teamwork. We are up against some things. We work in high stress, cognitively demanding environments. When crisis occurs, team interactions have been shown to be as important as medical, as the team's knowledge of the situation. Emergency conditions can occur suddenly, they can be unexpected, and in some circumstances they may occur with enough rarity that the people caring for those patients feel uncomfortable with it or out of practice. When JCO has evaluated medical errors, they found that 70% are linked to breakdowns in communication or other human factors. And maintaining effective performance under stress is essential because we all have a goal of decreasing errors that can lead to morbidity mortality. Errors can occur despite our technical expertise and we all care about what's best for our patients. And we want to take the best care of them that we can, and we are all responsible for the outcomes of our patients. <coughs> I'd like to 
borrow a story from the airline industry to help illustrate the point that I'd like to make. I think the picture is a bit of a giveaway, but stick with me. This is Eastern Airlines Flight 401 to Miami International Airport back in 1972. As the crew is flying, they notice um, upon their landing approach that the landing gear light has gone out in the cockpit. They recognize that they need to figure out, is the landing gear actually down or is this a malfunctioning light bulb? The captain sets the plane in autopilot while they work on this issue. Inadvertently, however, the captain disengages the autopilot. As the team works to ensure that the landing gear is down and try to fix the light, the plane slowly loses altitude. There are multiple alarm warnings heard to be going off in the room that, are un that go unnoticed by the team. It only takes 90 seconds for them to lose enough altitude that by the time they realize what has happened, uh, it's unrecoverable and the plane crashes into the Everglades. 101 of 176 people died. Um, and this was really the first major airline disaster that occurred. A series of other mistakes in the airline industry brought increased scrutiny to it and provoked change. Few have argued about the parallels between the fields of aviation and medicine because both of hours of normalcy punctuated by moments of sheer terror. Most people, I think, see the benefit in borrowing those best practices. What does a teamwork error look like in a medical setting? Most often our own lives are not at risk, but other people's are. In this situation, a woman named Elaine Bromley in 2007 was undergoing a routine nasal surgery. She, upon sedation, was unable to be intubated and unable to be ventilated. Anesthesiologists worked aggressively to help be able to ventilate and intubate her. However, her saturations were 40% for a prolonged period of time. OR nurses recognized that the patient urgently needed ventilation. They opened a trach kit to the bedside and left it open. But anesthesiologists continued their work in attempts to intubate and ventilate her. After 20 minutes, they were successful at establishing an airway, and the patient was admitted to the floor. Over the next 24 hours, however, she experienced worsening symptoms of hypoxic brain injury and subsequently died. The anesthesiologist cited being unaware of and surprised at how much time had actually elapsed during their resuscitation efforts. Here's an example of how we all want to do our best for our patients, and yet without effective teamwork, we may not be achieving our objectives. So what happens when personnel are brought together by chance in unusual circumstances? How are teams going to work together if an emergency happens in the gift shop or the cafeteria or the hallway or even outside the hospital? What typically happens is that no one assumes responsibility, that there's no specific delegation of tasks, that people intervene in ways that they know how to do, things that they know how to help with. But the team really wants and needs a leader, needs someone to stand up and um, start leading the group so we can have the best outcome. Out of the need for effective teamwork in a crisis setting was born this concept of initially called crew resource management in aviation, which was later adopted first by anesthesia and then by other fields in medicine and uh, termed crisis resource management. We'll be discussing exactly what crisis resource management is, um, but it essentially is a form of communication um, when caring for patients in a medical crisis. It's sort of the common language that we can use um, between people who may have never met, may have no idea what skills other people in the group might have. 
Um, they may be unfamiliar with their surroundings, not know where to get materials they might need or what resources are available to them. It is likely to be an emotionally charged situation. If we work to practice these processes, you might not know exactly all the terms of the situation you're in, but you know what you need to make out of it. You can still have an effectively functioning team of strangers. So training comes in many different forms, but there is a difference between doing training in a classroom, such as learning to intubate a patient on a mannequin head in a quiet classroom where you can learn to perfect your technique, you're in predictable conditions. This is different than stress inoculation training. So that's where you have the added pressure of time. It's a time-sensitive procedure you might be performing. Some ambiguity. Is this the right procedure I should perform? I'm not entirely sure. An increased task load. Not only do I have to um, focus on this, I need to worry about other things that are taking place at the same time. It's the difference between in intubating a mannequin head in a quiet classroom and trying to manage the airway of a screaming child, a, a panicked parent, the oxygen saturations are 60%. Doing that same procedure feels very different in different circumstances. <clears throat> so normal stress responses. At your normal resting heart rate of 60 beats per minute is where we start. When you start feeling increased stress, the first things that tend to start to deteriorate are fine motor skills. That could make it more difficult for a person to perform necessary critical procedures on their patients. As stress increases, complex motor skills can deteriorate, as well as things like cognitive processing. Um, problem solving becomes degraded. Thinking through the process of how you want to care for your patient becomes more and more difficult. You can also start to have some tunnel vision, losing your peripheral vision, not taking in all the information that you need to be doing. You can also have auditory exclusion, where you start ignoring things that are being said because you cannot manage that amount of incoming stimuli. And at the highest rates, people go into the irrational fight or flight response. They might freeze. I think we can all agree no one wants to be voiding their bowel or bladder <laughs> in the trauma bed. So to optimize performance, maybe what we really need is not just to manage the increase in our heart rate, but in fact, do something that's called a threat appraisal. So when a person is presented with a medical crisis or any crisis, what they tend to do is assess how severe the challenge is. How high is this challenge? Is this something that is a huge challenge that could be very difficult? If it is, a person wants to be sure that they have the skills and resources and team necessary to allow them to be successful. If they have those things, they will be in the flow. It'll be challenging, but they can handle it. And they will not be, even if their heart rate is higher, having the other de deleterious effects that we described in the previous slide. If you notice that the challenge is quite high, but you don't feel you have the resources necessary to manage it, you're going to be experiencing a large amount of anxiety. So the principles of crisis resource management need to be firmly imprinted so they can be used on those rare occasions and be used reflexively. One needs to cope with an unexpected crisis without losing your cool or your continence. And so that's when we started incorporating technology-enhanced simulation. 
It was adopted by the airline industries um, and has become a regular part of their training and continuing education. As of about 1966, there was the first um, human simulator mannequin. Um, was kind of rudimentary. But in the 90s, it was adopted by Dr. David Gaba, who really created the first more modern um, human high fidelity simulator. He is also responsible for um, transitioning the use of crew resource management to crisis resource management for the field of anesthesiology and then disseminated it to other fields as well. We feel that with the high fidelity human simulator, it's easier for participants to suspend disbelief, to act as they would in a true medical setting. It allows us to discuss the principles of crisis resource management, and we can immediately expose people to simulated crisis in their real in situ environment. All of our simulations are run in situ in the actual emergency department, in the actual ICU, where we would be caring for patients or on the floor. We are looking to evoke those physical and emotional responses that one would have in a real, in a real uh, crisis. And that is because stronger imprinting will take place, a more lasting memory of what occurred. Everyone remembers where they were on 9-11 because it was very emotionally charging. We're looking to evoke emotions that will make the, um, the lessons learned last longer. There have been systematic reviews and meta-analysis of the myriad of studies um, using simulation, which have shown large effect sizes in knowledge, self-reported confidence, skills, and behaviors. At this point, they've really only seen small to moderate effect sizes for patient outcomes that have not been reaching statistical significance. But no industry in which human lives depend on the skilled performance of responsible operators has waited for unequivocal proof of benefit of simulation before embracing it. There are lots of anecdotal evidence. In January of 2009, the US Airways Flight 1549 struck a flock of Canadian geese three minutes after takeoff, which de debilitated both the engines. Quickly determining that the pilot would be unable to reach any airport, he piloted the plane to the Hudson River for a water landing. The moments before he landed, he said, were the worst sickening pit of your stomach falling through the floor feeling he had ever experienced. He was a strong practicing proponent of crisis resource management in the airline industry. He explained one way of looking at this might be that for 42 years, I'd been making small regular deposits in a bank of experience, education, and training. And on January 15th, that balance was sufficient, and I made one very large withdrawal. All 150 people on board survived. All right, so Amy has done a fabulous job of just introducing you to the general concepts of crisis resource management and why we think it's important. Now I'm going to take an opportunity here to talk to you about some of the details. So many institutions choose to offer dedicated crisis resource management courses where you go for a week or you go for a weekend and you have this immersive course. We, on the other hand, um, as we have sort of integrated our SIMS into our community, um, have chosen to integrate the crisis resource management training as well. And so it's more of a longitudinal exposure over the period of years um, for a variety of people. So there are six principles of crisis resource management that we review prior to any simulation that we do. Um, because we want to make sure that people are paying, to, paying attention to them as they're doing the simulation, but then also as we're debriefing the simulation. And I'm going to talk about um, what those six principles are. There's two principles in each of three categories. So the first principle concept that we want to focus on is leadership. By definition, in the first few moments of any crisis, there's a vacuum of leadership. There's just not a leader yet. The longer that vacuum persists, however, the more dysfunctional the team dynamics can become. The team wants a leader. The team craves a leader. And without a leader, your efficiency and your effectiveness is going to suffer. Effective team leaders provide and maintain structure for the team. 
They present a fixed reference point, the hub of the wheel, the center point around which everything and everyone else functions. And ideally, they don't move around the room. Okay? They shouldn't be touching and doing and involving themselves unless it's absolutely necessary for do, them to do some, do so. Um, instead, they want their, their team members to be their eyes and their ears and their hands and to be then feeding that information that they are gathering back to the leader. An effective team leader communicates. They create the web that binds the team together so that the group knows each other, everyone knows the status of the patient, the participants repeat back what they're doing, what has been asked to do so that you can avoid under misunderstanding. The team leader is unambiguous, um, monitors the overall situation and the status of the tasks that he or she has asked someone to do, remains calm and respectful, but also in control, okay? One of the big things that will derail the whole team, the whole room in a crisis is when there's large amounts of sort of idle noise and, and other people um, talking, okay? So being an effective team leader, so this is Captain Sully. He's the gentleman, the captain who landed that plane on the Hudson River. Um, and effective leadership, like he said, it's not something that you are born with, although some people are, are more adept at it than others. But it, it is something to be learned. It's a skill that may not come naturally to everyone. Okay? Training helps the process, and training in crisis situations um, happen, helps even more. So for a little bit of a more local effective leader. <laughs> He's our Captain Sully. All right. Um, it's not just about the team leader, though. All right. It's also about the team. The team, the plane, the patient can sink or swim, crash or soar, live or die based on the team member's effectiveness as well. So having a good leader but having a team that is just all over the place and not communicating will also result in negative outcomes. Okay, criticism and confrontation in an aggressive or negative way in the middle of a, of a code or a, or a crisis situation is, is not what you're going for, but you should still have an environment in which people are comfortable to speak up if either they're confused or they're concerned that something is not going the way that you are expecting it to go. So depending on your situation, this is kind of what a, a team may look like. Um, you can have as many as eight roles in addition to the team leader. Okay, some of these can be combined reasonably well. And there's a variety of different sort of staff and, and levels of training that can fill some of these roles. Uh, and, and it's really going to be up to, to the team leader and, and to the situation in terms of who's going to fill what role and really what roles these need, what roles need to be filled. It's also okay in the middle of a crisis to have people change their roles. It's okay to have transitions of roles as long as that transition is communicated. So maybe the person who was the, the patient assessor and was helping with CPR, maybe they are better skilled at intubating than the person who was initially the airway provider and they need to swap. And now the person who was the airway provider needs to take over as the assessment and CPR and the person who was the assessor needs to, to try the intubation. Um, and that's okay as long as that switch, that swap, has been communicated so that the team leader is not going to ask the person who was originally assessing for some assessment. All right, so the next category or section of the crisis resource management principles that we teach is, is centered around communication. All right, so communication ideally starts with the pre-briefing um, on an expected patient who you know is coming, which is um, thankfully, the environment that I work in most often, most of the time I know somebody who's sick is coming. It can be one of the most important parts. It's an opportunity to get the team all on the same page. Here's what we expect. Here's how we expect it to go or what we expect to do about it. Um, if procedures are anticipated or medications are anticipated to be needed, they can be prepared ahead of time. That's going to save you time on the back end once you have the patient. Um, ideally, it happens before the patient arrives, but not always is that possible. Even if you don't have time before the patient arrives, and we don't always, people get dropped off at our door in, in extremis, um, you can still take 10, 20 seconds to just review, all right, this is what I've got, this is what we're doing, let's get organized, and let's, let's kind of address the issues. Okay, as opposed to everybody just kind of running into the room and starting 
whatever they think is necessary. The team must communicate effectively. Often in our lives, we become so ingrained in what we're doing, we're so habitual, that we don't think about communicating in words what it is that we've done or what it is that we're doing. People carry out certain tasks so often that it becomes habit not to be commented on. Team members placing a tourniquet on a limb in order to place an IV may not think to say, I put a tourniquet on this limb, and yet it may affect the readings coming out of that limb. Say the pulse ox is on that arm, and you're, the person who's the monitor watcher doesn't know that there's a tourniquet now blocking blood flow to that arm. You could lead to multiple interventions happening based on an abnormal pulse ox reading from the tourniquet because nobody spoke up and mentioned it. Okay, so under these circumstances, under these high stress circumstances, it's important to talk about what it is you're doing, even if it's routine, even if it's something you wouldn't normally say. So the method of closed loop communication that we teach, it, or sorry, the method of communication that we teach to use in the in the crisis situation is called closed loop communication. And so it would uh, look something like this. This is not how you normally communicate. It's really awkward. Uh, Dr. Hansen, would you hand me the orange stethoscope on the bench over there? You want the orange stethoscope? I would like the orange stethoscope. Here's the orange stethoscope. Thank you. I have the orange stethoscope. Okay. So <laughs> that's a little awkward. That's just not how we would talk to each other on a normal basis. But in a crisis situation, it can really help you clarify what it is that you want to get done and not have things that you don't want to have happen, happen. We are, by the way, not the only industry that, that uses this technique. If, uh, if anybody has ever watched Hell's Kitchen with uh, Gordon Ramsay, um, they, uh, they, they also use closed loop communication. <laughs> they do. All right, so in, in addition to using the closed loop communication, you wanna, you, you wanna be directive. Who do you want to do it? Use their name if you can. Use their title if you can't. You're not always going to necessarily know people's name, particularly if it's a sudden, unexpected event. Um, so for instance, I might say to my fabulous nurse over there, Allie, hi Allie, um, I might say, Allie, please get the patient on a monitor. Okay, I've given a directed order to a specific person. Be descriptive. What do you want to have done? The details can be critical, all right? So let's give amiodarone, code-based, uh, dosing based on an estimated weight of 20 kilos. I've told them what I want, I've given them an estimated weight to, to go by, um, and then be informative. So we've got lots of things happening at the same time, but only a limited number of people to do it. So for instance, the patient is seizing and in status epilepticus, we need to give both anti-epileptic drugs and prepare for intubation. Let's do the anti-epileptics first and then draw up the intubation drug. So now I've given them orders for multiple medications, but they know which order I want those medications to be prepared in. So in addition to closed loop communication, we also um, have periodic reorientation of the team, also known as reviewing the mental model. This is a brief recap, ideally happening about five minutes into the situation, into the crisis, that allows the team to be brought up to speed as they've been focused on their individual tasks. They've been examining the patient. Maybe they've been intubating the patient. Somebody else maybe have gotten the history. All that information has come back to the team leader, but the other team members don't have that information themselves. So doing a periodic reorientation allows everybody in the room to be brought up to speed. It also allows the team leader to invite other ideas from the group. This can be particularly important in a highly complex or unclear case where you're looking for ideas like what is my limited human brain not thinking of in this case. All right, so then the last category of things we teach in crisis resource management is avoidance of errors. Mistakes happen, we're all human, okay? It, it, we're not referring to errors like the wrong diagnosis or wrong medication, but rather errors that are related specifically to the team interaction. So Amy got to tell you a story and now it's my turn. So on August 6th of 1997, Korean Airlines Flight 801 was headed to Guam with an experienced flight crew. The jet was preparing to land in heavy rain. Visibility was poor. The radio system at the airport that broadcasts to the plane where they are um, in space was malfunctioning, okay? But the pilot didn't know that. He'd not 
gotten the message. And he was getting a signal from some other beacon that he thought was the signal from the airport. The co-pilot and flight engineer, um, which they heard discussing when they recovered the flight recorder, um, made repeated mention that the airport is not in sight. Okay, why are we trying to land just yet? We can't see the airport. Or are you sure that the radio is working properly? To which the captain said, yes, I, I have the beacon signal. It's working properly. They made multiple statements like, we can't see the airport. The rain is awfully thick. I, I know what I'm doing. We're, we're, we're good. Right up until they flew into the side of a mountain. Um, so the alarms for low altitude were ignored because he was relying on the, the beacon that he thought he had. Um, and they crashed three miles short of the airport. Um, 228 out of the 254 patients died that, or patients, passengers died that day. All right. So in the Elaine Brumley case that we've talked about briefly, um, the OR nurse opened the cricothyrotomy kit and placed it next to the anesthesiologist but didn't directly call the attention to the persistent hypoxia or the amount of elapsed time. Didn't explicitly state her concern. And then closer to home, a two-year-old patient comes in with vomiting and difficulty breathing. Um, heart rate on initial assessment is 210. The patient is fussy, but otherwise not distressed. She's placed on a cardiac monitor and noted to be an SVT. An IV is placed and the team leader asks for amiodarone, rapid IV push. The medication nurse checks the code book for the appropriate weight-based dose of amiodarone, hands it to the bedside nurse who pushes the medication. The patient then becomes profoundly bradycardic, hypotensive, requires CPR, intubation, pressors, and PICU admission. In follow-up, the nurse thought the medication choice was odd, but had worked with that provider for many years, had great confidence in, in him or her, I actually don't know, but little confidence in herself. She just didn't think she knew enough to question the order, all right? The team leader is not an absolute monarch, all right? They are human just like all of the rest of us. They can have a bad day. Um, they're not unchallengeable. They don't necessarily even need to be the person in the room with the largest knowledge base. They don't necessarily need to be a physician. The team should always have a clearly defined team leader, but this shouldn't create a rigid hierarchy to treat them as such is to invite an error of hierarchy. Instead, the team leader, like I said before, is the hub of the wheel, and that wheel is designed to take the team where the team needs to go. So errors of hierarchy can be avoided by flattening the power differential and by empowering people to speak up and encouraging questions. In the case of the Korean Airlines flight, the way they solved this problem was to actually change the language that was spoken in the cockpit, cockpit to English rather than Korean. Korean society is very hierarchical, and in the Korean language, there is no words available to them for a, a lower-level officer to question a superior. It just doesn't exist. So they changed it to English because we're better at it. <laughs> in our case, we've... In, we've implemented multi, multidisciplinary simulation sessions with faculty and staff and residents and nurses and fellows. And periodically, we actually use a confederate um, to intentionally introduce a medication error and see if anybody will question it. You'd be amazed at how many times it doesn't get questioned. But people come out of those simulations knowing that it's okay to question if you're concerned about an order. So the second major, major error that we talk about in crisis resource management is the error of fixation. Fixation can occur at many levels, okay? So you can have um, an, an error of fixation at the team level. The defibrillator is not working and everybody tries to fix it while nobody monitors the patient. At a diagnostic level, Occam's razor does not always apply in medicine. The simplest exclamation is not always the best. And at the individual level, particularly with regards to the team leader, if the team leader has to become involved in a procedure, which sometimes that needs to happen, the team should still not be without a team leader. You can transition that leadership to somebody else in the room while the team leader performs the procedure that it's necessary for them to do. So with regards to the 
Elaine Brumley case, the anesthesiologist involved, like we said, when they reviewed the case, had no idea that the patient had been hypoxic for more than 20 minutes. When you're engaged in trying to address a problem, time can get away with you, to get away from you, and, and damage can happen in that time. We had a, a simulation case uh, one time when the defibrillator malfunctioned. It wouldn't charge. The entire team tries to fix the defibrillator. We, being the people that we are, change the patient from, um, pulse, from VTAC with a pulse to VTAC without a pulse. It took them eight minutes to recognize the patient was no longer talking and had no pulse. Thank goodness that was a simulation case. All right, so it's easy to be distracted. Okay, there's a lot going on. And whether you're flying this space shuttle to the space station or you're resuscitating a trauma, there's a lot going on. Information overload can be triggered as a protective reflex. So we, Amy talked about your stress response. You, you get tunnel vision, okay? And the most obvious or attention-grabbing problem being, in a, being it being a malfunctioning landing gear light or an amputated extremity may not be the most urgent or the most imminently life-threatening problem that that person or that situation has. All right, so now, something completely different. for something completely different. Would you like a piece of candy? Um, yes, please. Okay. Here you go. This is the wrapper? Thanks. Okay, little buddy, hang in there. It's okay. What's happening to him? Come on, little buddy, hang in there. Keep breathing for me, okay? Just keep breathing. We probably What's need more help in here. We need Epi. Get some albuterol. I'm getting back close. What can I do to help? What's happening? I don't know what's I don't know. going on. What's going on? What happened? We were in the hallway, I, I gave him candy, he I started gagging, and, Where is the Epi? and the next thing I know, he fell on the ground. Oh, roll him, suction him. Oh, gross, please. Yes. I need a towel. Oh, about time. I need him to suction, and I needed some albuterol like five minutes ago. All right, if nobody What's else happening is going here? to do is it. Is he going to be okay? Are these hives? I think so. He's Here's never the had before. No, 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 no. That's not right. I don't think that's right. It's what's in there. No, this is IV epi. We need IM epi. The one milligram, one milliliter, one to one thousand. IM epi, right? Yeah, IM epi, but why are we giving epi? He's barely wheezy. We haven't tried albuterol yet. What's happening? Okay. Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> show of hands. 
Who here has ever participated in the medical care resuscitation of patients that had any of the medical issues that we saw here? Okay. So what teamwork issues did the group experience? Ones that maybe people have seen in real life before. Does anyone care to share? No leader. Yeah. No role. Um, okay. <clears throat> Anything else that anyone noticed? Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So there is something called um, situational situational awareness. So situational situational awareness would be: Does the team know what the patient has. So what do we think that patient was experiencing? Anaphylaxis. And what did the team members think he was experiencing? Yeah, there was some confusion. Was it anaphylaxis? Was it a foreign body? Were there any other ideas? And possibly an asthma exacerbation. It was a bit unclear, and the group, it seemed like, could not coordinate their resuscitative efforts appropriately because of that. Any other teamwork issues that people identified? You mentioned the closed-loop communication. Um, what did people notice with regard to that? How were the, how were the orders being given? Yeah, and how do they say that? They say, we need this, let's get, let's get that, um, not directed at any specific person. Hey, so, anyone have doctors help you with cell phones? <laughs> 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 using your resources. <laughs> get it to them. That's using your resources right there. Yeah. Um, and then what about in regards to the epinephrine? What do people think about the exchange that took place regarding the epinephrine? What, what, what is the correct <laughs> dose? Did they have the correct medicine or did they not have it? Does anyone know? Yeah. So they were, in fact, carrying the um, IV dose of the medication and not the IM dose. That is a very big problem that we see. And, you know, there's a lot of different measures taking place to help try to remedy that, you know, referring to it in different ways, different packaging to try to prevent that. Um, but the because the orders were unclear, the medication that was chosen was incorrect. And easily in this patient, uh, it could have been administered in error. It really has. And, you know, what would be the possible outcome to the patient from that? <clears throat> what do you guys think? Any other residents? What could happen if someone in anaphylaxis gets IV epi instead of, or gets IV epi IM? They might feel great. <laughs> they might feel great, or they might not. If they might have an arrhythmia, they could have other, um, yeah, hypertension is a serious concern. Yeah. So the errors that people make can have real effects and possibly very damaging effects on their patients. And what else, interaction, um, what was the tone of the interaction with the patient? Did you feel like that was a comfortable working Speaking on? Speaking to the mic. Sorry? Speaking to the mic. Oh, well, what was the tone of the interactions that, that you that you, that you observed was was that a comfortable work environment? Would you have wanted to be a team member in that in that resuscitation? Why? What did you hear? What did you see? How did it make you feel? Okay. 
is frantic. Is it, what, how, what was disrespectful? Like what? Yeah. Right. So she she said a lot with the with just not just her words, but also with the with the tone of voice that she was using and how she was interacting. Um, has anybody ever been in a situation where somebody has spoken like that in a stressful situation? Yeah, it's very uncomfortable, and, and I'm pretty sure that we've we've all been there. Um, it's, it's just something to be aware of when you are stressed, when you are in a stressful environment. Sometimes we don't always put our best foot forward. But again, like Dr. Hansen said earlier, practicing in the stress environment, in the simulated stress environment, can really help improve that. So let's do it again, but better. Hang in there, little buddy. You're going to be okay. Hang Can in you there. go get some more help? Hang in there. Is it going to be okay? You should be okay, Mommy. Just take your phone. Okay. Hang in there, buddy. Stay with me, okay? Just keep breathing. It's okay. I'm Dr. Sperlin from the ED. Dr. Stivers, what's the situation? We have a six-year-old male who developed gagging and difficulty breathing after eating a piece of candy. Then he collapsed. He's pale, sweaty, and wheezing. He's alert, but he's in significant respiratory distress, and he's intermittently vomiting. All right. From that information, it sounds like he's having anaphylaxis. I'll be the team leader. Lee, could you please get him on the monitor and start an IV? Yes, I'll put him on the monitor and start an IV. Dr. Stivers, we need more help. Can you go get some additional nursing antiperbole and RT if possible? Yes, I'll get more help. Oh, hang in there, buddy. They're doing everything they can to help you, okay? It's going to be okay. Just keep breathing for me. Hey, guys, we have a six-year-old uh, little guy here with uh, vomiting, wheezing, and significant respiratory distress after eating a piece of candy. His symptoms are most consistent with anaphylaxis. Um, Lee, can you continue to watch the monitor, please? Dr. Stivers, continue to assess and perform CPR if need arise. Um, nurse uh, May, would you please do IV meds and um, fluids? Um, we don't know his weight. We're going to estimate 20 kilos for him. RT, um, could you please do the airway? Um, go ahead and start him on an albuterol, Deb, possibly in a 100% non-rebreather oxygen. Non-rebreather and albuterol. Correct. Um, Allie, could you be med prepped and go ahead and, and get an IE, IM dose of epinephrine ready? Um, that would be 0 0.01 mg per kilo or 0.2 milligrams IM. Okay, so you want epinephrine, the 1 milligram oh, per milliliter concentration. You. you want 0 0.01 mg per kg. Based on your 20 kilo estimated weight, that would be 0.2 milligrams IM, right? Correct. Okay, I got it. Dr. Sperling, it appears there's a lot of vomit that's in his mouth. I think he needs some suction first. Okay, please do suction and then start him on the oxygen. Okay, please don't let him choke, please. Okay, the airway is sectioned and clear. I'm going to start the non rebreather and prep the albuterol. All right, great. His lips and tongue are swollen, and he has diffuse urticaria on my exam. Right, this is angioedema and urticaria, which is consistent with our diagnosis of anaphylaxis and not a foreign body aspiration. Okay, I have your IM epi 2.2 milligrams. I already have an IV. Are you sure you don't want this IV? No, anaphylaxis epi is IM to the lateral thigh. Okay, I'm going to give 0.2 milligrams. I am Epi to the lateral thigh. Hang right. in there, little guy. Hang in there, buddy. Allie, Epi is in. Could you go ahead and draw up an IV dose of solumedrol, IV Benadryl, and IV Zantac? Okay. okay, you want IV Benadryl, IV Solumedrol, IV it's Zantac okay, based on your estimated 20 kilos, right? Correct. Okay. Doctor, the patient's blood pressure is 80 over 32. Would you like a bolus as well? Great catch. Yes. Nurse May, could you please draw up a 20 mil per kilo or 400 mils normal saline bolus and please give that push pull? You want a 20 ml? Per kilogram normal saline bolus of 40, 400 ml bolus push pull IV. Perfect. Nurse Ellie, could you go ahead and draw up uh, another dose of Epi, uh, an IM dose, just in case he does not improve? Okay, you want another 0.2 of IM Epi, correct? Correct. Okay. Does he have an allergic reaction or something? Ma'am, I'm going to have Dr. Stivers update you and get a little bit more information while we continue to care for your son. Thank you. All right, that's it. Let's hear it for him. <laughs> you can appreciate the differences um, in those resuscitations. After we do resuscitations um, or if we're doing simulation, simulated resuscitations, we 
follow it with a debriefing. Um, in it, we try to allow the team to learn from that event and to prepare for the next one. Actually, one of our fellows, Dr. Zargam, is working to develop a curriculum with which we'll debrief after real events in the emergency room. It allows us to analyze the actions of the team. What was done? Did it differ from what should have been done? Were any novel solutions identified to unanticipated problems that we should try to incorporate into our practice in the future? What impacts did our care have on the patient and use that to maintain or improve our future performance? Like we said, there's not a lot of um, data that definitively says simulation changes patient outcomes. However, a lot of people feel strongly that it helps. For the nurses and the physicians and the people who, and the respiratory therapists who were involved in this, anyone I asked to do this was willing to do it. And I think that's because people feel like it helps. During my own fellowship, we practiced interprofessional simulations in the ED with a variety of different um, services. Um, we had been practicing trauma resuscitations with the trauma surgeons and trauma nurse practitioners. We happened to, following one of these um, simulated events, the following day had a two-year-old child that came in, drowned in a river in May of 2013. He was lost for 37 minutes before being recovered and was pulseless um, upon getting him out of the water. The water was kind of mountain water. It was unclear exactly how cold it could have been, but the temperature was like in the 70s during the day, and we all, no one knew how cold was the water. Was it cold enough that he could have been hypothermic before becoming pulseless, or did he become pulseless and hypothermic as a result of that. But when he arrived at the ED, he had a temp of like 82 degrees. After 68 minutes of resuscitation and some warming efforts, the trauma surgeon recommended cessation of care. They were very concerned about the neurologic status of that patient. He uh, instructed the resuscitation to stop, and after 10 to 20 seconds, a nurse spoke up. She said, I, I feel a pulse. It's slow, but it's there. The team discussed the finding, and we all agreed to continue warming and resuscitative efforts. The patient was admitted to the ICU and um, actually made a remarkable neurologic recovery, and his only deficit was some mild arm weakness. But it was that nurse, and I think the fact she had been present the day before at a simulation with the same group of people it just seemed like the perfect storm to allow this kid the chance to survive. Codes are infrequent, but the principles of crisis resource management can be utilized during every shift. <clears throat> you don't need to wait for the next code to practice these principles. You can practice them every time you're giving or receiving orders, going to rapid responses, or doing your sedations, or any changes in patient status. I'd like to really thank the participants. Maggie is the actress we used. Keegan is Megan's son, was the actor. <laughs> our nurses, Allie, uh, Elaine Lee, the respiratory therapist, Sarah, and our physicians, Elizabeth Divers and ben, Beth Berlin. They came in on their free time. Elizabeth is on vacation right now. Um, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. And to Dr. Calhoun and to Dr. Stevenson for the support and to the audiovisual guys, Daniel and Jamie, for the help as well with the audio and visual. Thank you guys very much for participating. Appreciate it. It's really great, and thank you, um, thank you for that. I, one simple question. I noticed during the, simula the good simulation mm -hmm. that there was a mixture of generic drug names and trade names. And I think that's a potential yeah. pitfall for confusion. Yeah. So as a should we ban trade names forever from the hospital? In orders, <clears throat> in our oral yeah. communication, Zantac has a generic name. Yeah. Stalumedrol has a generic name. And I just think it's a potential for I, things to I get agree. confused. Yeah. So I, I wonder is that is Jan 
here or someone from P and T. I mean, is that is that a JCO standard? Are you supposed to use trade? I mean, I hear patients all the time are started on rocephin, not ceftriaxone. Yeah. I think it's wrong. I think you're right, and I think a lot of stuff is saying we should be using those um, generic names. Even epi is not recommended. We should be saying epinephrine. You know. A little quickly, I have to run to another meeting, but I, I want to say thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is important work that we do. You know, we think of science as being in the laboratory and sometimes a clinical trial, but if we don't carry those types of uh, that knowledge into the bedside effectively, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And this is a critical type of work that gets that that final, you know, ten yards mm -hmm. into the end zone that is so critical. So. We need to do more of this. Uh, education research is a yeah. big piece of where we need to go. Kim, you can comment further on that. But uh, just so you know, I, I think this is very valuable work. So thank you. Thank you. <coughs> One thing about the, the trade names, and trade names are not smart in my book. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing is for boards and things like that, trade names are not allowed. So everybody really needs Yeah, I mean, I think that would be something to <coughs> say that we think about the role of pharmacists as being in this area. Mm -hmm. Yes. There, uh, it's a nice presentation, but uh, you got to start with that crash cart, and you have to stock it identically, identically, so that everybody on at least one ward. Yeah. Knows where every single thing is in that crash cart. Mm -hmm. The nurse who depicted it there was very good when she started slamming drawers open and shut yeah. and suddenly got down looking for a vial of epinephrine down where all the stethoscopes mm -hmm. and otoscopes were. Yeah. Not logical. Every shift, that cart has to be checked by the nurse in charge mm -hmm. to be fully stocked and have everything visible and identifiable and drawers can't be open to see a box of little bitty vials of all sorts of different colors and especially if somebody is not doing a crash code mm -hmm. say at least once a week so please emphasize that okay I can't, the worst words in the crash, in the presentation is, doctor, I'm sorry, but I can't find the sodi bicarb. You know, yeah. come on, folks, you've got to be able to do it like that. If you can do it like that, then you're under a hell of a lot less pressure. Yeah, and that's part of why in, during the simulations we have them use our simulation crash cart, so people be, can become f more familiar with the location of things. Yeah. That it correlates. Okay. Thank you.